Greetings, All Souls family. Uh, before I start this reflection, I would like to give some thanks. I would like to thank all of you who have held me in prayer and those of you who have brought me food and throat lozenges and ginger ale and soup and care during this time and onions. Let me not forget onions, which have been central to my healing and vitamins. And I would also like to thank my daughter Mungi for doing the reflection a couple of weeks ago and to thank Rebecca for doing last week's reflection and to thank Tahani and Miranda for their collaboration in that reflection. And I would also like to thank all who participated in our Zoom book study of The Cross and The Lynching Tree. Um, I want to let you know right now that this reflection is going to be longer than my normal reflection, so I'm warning you and you might want to take a break um, and come back to it. Um, but I, I feel that it is a very important one. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke about a Kairos moment for us and for our church. And here we are the week of after Mother's Day. And on Mother's Day, I was fortunate enough to get calls from each of my children and to be able to see them and to talk to them and to experience their love. And I could not help but reflect that this was the first Mother's Day for Armand Arbery's mother, Ahmad Arbery's mother, without her son. And as much as Mother's Day was a day full of love for me, it was always, it was also a day full of pain and anger and wondering how long is this going to carry on? We, as part of our church's work, decided to do the book study on the cross and the lynching tree. And it is so heartbreaking that as we wrapped up that study, we have the example of a young black man in 2020 being lynched. And not only that, but then seeing the justice system in this country able to drag its feet over even investigating the crime of his murder. And then the video comes out of his death. And I couldn't help but think of the postcards and pictures that was sent out following lynchings in this country's history. And after that video, I knew that in no time at all, we would be having a search of his criminal history. And indeed, sure enough, we have a district attorney saying that she recused herself from the case because she and one of the men who murdered him had prosecuted Ahmad earlier. As a black mother, I am not surprised that Ahmad had had a, had had interactions, to put it mildly with the US justice system. As a black mother, I know that it is more of a surprise for us when our children have not had interactions with the US justice system. 
I lived for many years in Nashville in one of the more affluent neighborhoods of Nashville. My children were educated in private schools and so through them, through that experience, I learned of the numbers of their friends who were stopped with drugs who were stopped for drunk driving. And because those young people were white, their parents had an opportunity to send them away to somewhere for rehabilitation. They were given over and over opportunities to not be embroiled in the justice system. And I also had black friends whose children were stopped with marijuana in their car and who spent years incarcerated in the U.S. justice system. So no, I was not surprised as a Black mother to have to be told that Ahmad had had uh, interactions with the U.S. justice system. And then I was not surprised as a Black mother to then have a video released showing him walking in an unfinished building, a construction site, and that being given as a possibility of why these people felt they, they had the right to hunt him down fully armed. How many of you have walked through unfinished homes? yours or other people's in your neighborhoods? How many white people seeing a construction site and nobody working are uh, interested, are uh, pushed to go in and, and look and see what does an unfinished house look like? What does a building structure look like? And how many of you have then been hunted down for that? I'm sure many of you have done the former. I'm sure none of you have experienced the latter. And so I come to you today as a, a priest, as a black woman, as a black mother, as somebody who was called into this community because this community, this faith community, this church, All Souls Cathedral in Asheville said that they wanted to be a part of the struggle for racial and economic equity in this community, Asheville, in this state, North Carolina, in this country and in this world. And when I was first interviewed, I was asked what was the thing that I was concerned about in taking this job. And I said at that time that my biggest concern is that as time unfolds, as things become more difficult, as the rubber hits the road, if you like, if, as we are asked to put our bodies, our money where our mouth is, that people in our faith community would become more and more uncomfortable and that I, if I continue to raise the issues, would find myself labeled as an angry black woman. And over this last time, maybe as I've been ill and been at home alone, having time to think, having time to reflect, I was reminded that before I was ordained, I used to do public speaking. And I have often and often said in that role, said that, you know, people use that phrase angry black woman as a way to shut black women down, to stop us raising issues, to stop us highlighting injustices. And so I have decided that I am going to preempt that and let people know that when I introduce myself, I say, hi, my name is Nondombi Naomi, angry black woman, Tutu. 
And I had forgotten that introduction. And I have decided to reclaim that introduction. I am the Reverend Canon Nondombi Naomi Cecilia, angry black woman Tutu, and I am speaking to you today about my anger, my concern, and my hope. And as I thought of this time, as I thought of Ahmad and of his mother, I remembered a time after Trayvon Martin had been murdered that I was forced to have a conversation with my son because I had been acting like an overprotective mother. That is an understatement, in fact, to what I had been doing. And so I had to have a conversation with him reminding him and myself of our claim of a religious imagination that uh, James Cone speaks of, a religious imagination that allows us to thrive in situations of injustice. And out of that experience, I actually wrote a paper for one of my classes in Divinity School. It's a paper that I have shared with others. Um, and I decided that I wanted to share that paper, which I wrote as a letter to my son with you today. To Mbilo. I know I have probably scared you over the last few months. This has not been a great summer for you, I'm sure. I know that I have really hounded you about where you are going, who you are going to be with, when are you planning to be home? I know you have resented me calling you three or four times a day and even more at night to check on where and how you are. I know you have felt as though I did not trust you to use your common sense and that I was treating you as though you were six rather than 16. I'm sorry. I am so sorry. I realize that I have let my reaction to the Trayvon Martin murder color everything we have done this summer. I want you to know that everything I did came from a place of love and fear. Each time you walked out the door, I imagined people looking at you and not seeing the sweet, irritating, funny, noisy, friendly young man I know you to be, but a scary black man. Each time I got a call from a strange number, I felt my heart move to my throat as I worried that it was someone calling to tell me that you had been arrested, beaten, even killed. You have not yet done anything that should get you arrested. Well, at least as far as I know, and I am trusting that that is indeed so, except to be born a black boy. I have tried to give you opportunities I did not have and guidelines to live a positive life. And yet, for all of that, I realize that in the end, for many, you will always be nothing more than the color of your skin. I have tried to teach you to be proud of who you are and who you have come from and to offer others respect in their many differences even as I have known that to much of the world, you are deficient simply because of your race. I sat down this afternoon at the kitchen table, worried again about letting you go out with your friends, wondering what on earth I could do to free you of my fear while still keeping you safe. I realize now that I can never keep you safe. 
I can teach you the drill of what to do when you are stopped by police so that you are not seen as a threat. I can practice you with you the do's and don'ts for a black boy in this time, in this place. I can make you call me each time you leave the house to let me know you have reached your destination and are safe. I can insist that you tell me if you and your friends change your plans and go to grab something to eat rather than to go to the movies. I can call you when I feel as though it has been too long since I have heard from you. And I will continue to do all of those things as much as I know you hate many of them. But... I cannot keep you safe. What I can do is release you from my fear. And that is what I want to try to do. Today, I reread one of my favorite books by one of my favorite authors, Jesus and the Disinherited by Howard Thurman. And it reminded me of where I have come and how my parents and grandparents released me from their fear. When I first read this book, it spoke to me so directly of my experience as a child in South Africa and helped me to recognize in myself a child of God, no matter what apartheid had tried to teach me. So as I struggled with my fear for you, I returned to it. For myself and also for you, I read and reread the chapter on fear. I so recognized the fear he spoke about in my own life, knowing that I could simply disappear one day or have a loved one do so and have absolutely no recourse. But when that fear is for your child, the stakes are raised even higher. Thurman reminded me that it is so easy to make the fear that is part of being oppressed the determining factor in the way we raise our children. He describes what it does to a child to be raised with fear as the central fact of his or her life. The doom of the children is the greatest tragedy of the disinherited. They are robbed of much of the careless rapture and spontaneous joy of merely being alive. Those are Thurman's words. I know this to be true, and I also know that it is possible to offer our children a freedom that the world cannot take from them, no matter how much the hatred and scorn they encounter. Thurman goes on to say, and I quote, if, on the other hand, the elders understand in their own experiences and lives the tremendous insight of Jesus. It is possible for them to share their enthusiasm with their children. I have seen it happen in communities that were completely barren, with no apparent growing edge, without any, pri any point to provide light for the disadvantaged. I have seen children grow up without fear, with quiet dignity and such high purpose that the mark which they have set for themselves has even been transcended." Unquote. Mbilo, that is the quote that made me write to you today. I remembered how my family had strived to make this our experience. I remember being told over and over how I was loved by them and most importantly by God. I remember your gogo and kulu and my gogo and mkulu teaching me that I was fearfully and wonderfully made in God's image no less. 
They taught me that being fearfully made was the absolute opposite of living in fear. It was about acknowledging the glory of God that lived in me. They let me know that I was meant to be here. I was meant to be me, a black girl on God's planet. Their teachings and their love helped me to see beyond apartheid's walls to the world that was God and not the nationalist parties. It was the best gift they ever gave me. Now I want to give you the same gift. I share Thurman's own words with you so that when I forget and go into my fear for you, you will know that that is not the real story of my love for you. The real story is that when I look at you, I am filled with love and pride, with awe and wonder and with gratitude. Live your largest, fullest life my son. You are fearfully and wonderfully made in God's image. I speak those words to you all souls, asking you to step up in this Kairos moment, to stand with people of color, with black people, as we say, this system is killing us. I ask you, people of all souls, to truly live your commitment to racial and economic equity. Thank you. As the closing prayer for this week's reflection, I have chosen to share with you a video by Common Hymnal. Common Hymnal is a gathering of Christian musicians, young Christian musicians, singers, songwriters who have taking it upon themselves to use their music of worship to highlight um, issues of injustice and to challenge the church in the 21st century to live into its full being. This song is called Rose Petals and we used it as our closing prayer for our book study on the cross and the lynching tree. It is a powerful song and I hope you will listen and hear its message. Amen. Spilled on the street He was the rose That grew out of the concrete The same ground where his body lay Like rose petals On a stony grave Why do we fear each other From the lies of yesterday I'll never know Look at all these roses With petals on the ground They call this one my ground I'm asking you To look at all these roses With petals on the ground 
They call this one Trayvon Martin I'm asking you to look at all these roses With petals on the ground They call this one type Sean Lee I'm asking you to look at all these roses With petals on the ground Far too many for me The tears of my mother Were spilled at his grave She knows the cost The whole world could not repay And when she should have felt our sympathy All we told her is that a baby was guilty And do we even have compassion? Do we even want to see? I'll never know But look at all these roses With petals on the ground They call this one Freddie Gray I'm asking you to look at all these roses Petals on the ground. They call this one Eric Gardner. I'm asking you to look at all these roses with petals on the ground. They call this one Sandra Bland. I'm asking you to look at all these roses with petals on the ground. Every woman, every man Oh, sometimes I wonder If you were more than a number Would we ever see how beautiful And special and precious you were Somebody told me That if only, if only You would better decide would still be alive But I'm asking you to Look at all these roses With the petals on the ground Like the ones from Sandy Hook I'm asking you To look at all these roses With the petals on the ground they will change the story in our history books So while we can, let's look at all these roses Look at all these roses Look at all these roses With petals on the ground I'm asking you to look at all these roses Look at all these roses Look at all these roses With petals on the ground
victory.